So I'm the editor-in-chief of IEEE Software for Arshal, and I'm here today with Philippe Kirsten. Uh, we met up at the Better Software East conference where Philippe just gave a keynote uh, that I went to ask him a little bit about this morning. Uh, so Philippe, one of the upcoming special issues that we have is on a metaphor called the Twin Peaks of Requirements and Architecture. And it talks a lot about how those two parts of the process influence each other, uh, how, the, how much there's synergy and interplay between the two. And since your keynote just gave a lot of uh, insight, I think, into how people do the architecting side of the equation, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about you know, how, how those architects can relate to things in the requirements and vice versa. But first I wanted to just uh, have you talk a little bit about the point of your keynote, because I took a note here that said, I think the major message that you were giving was that as software engineers we tend to think of ourselves as very rational people, uh, and maybe, maybe that's overstating the issue, is that true? Yeah, in the end, you know, it took me um, 30 years to discover it, but we're not <laughs> that rational as human beings. We all are reasoning daily uh, uh, is marred by cognitive biases and little reasoning fallacies. It goes also to sometimes political games that people play with each other. Um, but um, yeah, in software engineering, we tend to, for instance, uh, fall very rapidly in the confirmatory bias, you know, getting getting all kind of confirmation of the thing that we believe already, but discarding all the negative data. Uh, just to use one example. And, and the talk you gave focused on some of the games that architects play among themselves and with other architects that might lead to non-optimal architectures. It, um, you know, and I, I felt it was particularly interesting for this special issue because I think that as architects play these games, I mean, what we're essentially doing is not meeting the requirements, maybe, in the way that some of the folks intended. Well, I wouldn't put that just on the architect. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I, see, I see requirements and architecture as almost a continuum. You know, a, a requirement and an architectural decision are basically the same thing. A requirement is just a decision that has been made by somebody else than the architect. And all two things are, um, you know, depending on, the, on, on each other. And where you put the boundary between an architectural decision and a requirement is pretty much arbitrary. Uh -huh. And actually, this is a wider continuum because architectural decision, you know, go into more detailed design decision and code, which is also mm -hmm. decision. So, yeah, there's less little political games and reasoning fallacy that you can do at the very low level, mm -hmm. uh, but in the requirement and architecture, that's where we see a lot of uh, strange things happening when people do not quite explain the line of reasoning, the premises are based on some mm -hmm. funny ideas, <laughs> uh, beliefs, uh, rituals. Yes. Good. Well, I'm glad you said that because one of the things I was going to ask was, I mean, so we have these games that, within an architecture team, I guess, that make us you know, do things that we think are rational decisions but are maybe not quite leading us to the, the, uh, the right architecture in a way. Uh, so I think what you're saying is that it's not just on the architects to police themselves, but in a, in a way that maybe there's game, similar games that would go on among the requirements engineers in terms of you know, making decisions that are, are not quite rational uh, in, in terms of what the requirements are going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think that it's, it's just, you know, it's not just the, the people defining the problem, the product, whatever, who are fully rational and then suddenly the software people put all kind of uh, <laughs> strange thing there. It's, it's pretty prevalent in, in the whole, in the whole aspect of our life. Actually. So maybe I was just thinking for the folks watching the video that haven't seen the keynote, maybe you could give a few examples of some of the games so they have a better idea of what we're talking about. The kind of games people uh, people play. Um, well, there's a, a wide range. Uh, um, one, one interesting one, actually, uh, that uh, combines all kind of um, biases and preconceived ideas and confirmatory bias are about let's do a pilot project. You know, we have this brand new system, oh we should do a pilot to pilot the process or this technology, you know, try out the team. Usually you know we we see here a lot of uh, 
the confirmatory bias being at play. Mm -hmm. We're going to eliminate anything that doesn't lead to the conclusion that we had uh, uh -huh. predefined. And then we're going to bring only certain elements and say, oh, well, we're not doing that because this is just a pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. We've carefully selected the people who are going to be part of the pilot. And we carefully selected the pilot. So it all depends, you know, what you want to prove. Actually, maybe you can also prove that something is not going to work mm -hmm. or predefined in, uh, in the pilot. But we just see everybody playing his own role there, mm -hmm. playing nice. And, uh, learning lessons. And okay. I was glad you picked that one, actually, because I think that several of the games, at least to me, they sounded like things that would be positive if I do them right. But I think the message was that there's ways that, well, there's biases that come into place that we're messing up what we're doing even when we're not necessarily realizing it. Like, uh, one of the other examples was the, the Blink game. Where yeah, I, Blink is not so much a, a, a game, I would say, but it's something uh, a, a lot of us, especially when we have some experience, we tend to make decisions very rapidly because we can recognize something we're familiar with and we know that we have some element of a solution that satisfies it. We recognize it extremely rapidly within a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. We don't actually fully say, oh, I recognize this problem and I have a solution. We, we just go very, very fast. And this is pretty helpful because it, it helps you know experienced teams, experienced people to proceed relatively fast. But we have to watch ourselves. You know, we we are very, very rapidly eliminating a lot of a large potential, a large range of potential solutions by doing that. So on one hand, it's it's okay when it's played by people who have a lot of experience. You know, if people are relatively beginner and junior, the blink aspect is going to sort of lead them to some very, very narrow path. Um, yeah, that's one that has, you know, both positive and negative mm -hmm. aspect. And we can, yeah. we can connect it to other, other things, you know, golden hammer, you know, I have this, you know, solution that I love or this technology that I like or this programming language that I like. And I, I'm not even looking at the whole problem, just a few words that you say and oh, boom. <laughs> and there was my golden hammer, you know, everything is a nail. You know? yeah. So if I put it in the context of requirements and, and uh, requirements engineers and architects you know, talking to each other, I think it seems to me a lot of these patterns or games, I mean, are going to lead to very uncreative solutions on the architecture side. I mean, like you said, with the, the golden hammer, I have my one solution I want to use for everything, so I'm going to be designing something that looks like the same system maybe over and over and over again. Yeah, you, you see these strange dialogues with actually the, the software designers or architect or whatever, they don't even completely listen, you know. Uh -huh. the, the people from the requirement side start opening their mouths and people already picture, you know, pull down menus yes, and, yes, yes, yes. and Apache there and MySQL <laughs> there, you know. We're not even discussing about that, you know, we haven't even described, you know, what the users want to do with the system. Mm -hmm. But, oh yeah, yeah, I, I know how to do that, you know, that we're already there with pretty fine solutions. Mm -hmm. So is there, I, I was wondering, is there something that the requirements folks can do when they're talking to make sure that they get heard? I, I don't know if it's, it, is it, you know, the, the less ambiguity I leave, the more I'm going to drive you out of maybe some of the, the current modes of thinking that you might jump to necessarily? Um, we, can, we can do the same thing, you know, uh, at the, the level of uh, requirements. Very often, I've been in a situation where we challenge the requirements. Mm -hmm. Why do we have this requirement? Where does it come from? Uh -huh. How did you come up with this? Uh -huh. And sometimes, you know, the requirement people sort of say, well, all the system we've designed have that. <laughs> yes, but this is, a, is, is this a sufficiently good reason? Mm -hmm. well, you know, why as an end user would we ever do this? Mm -hmm. Do you have any concrete evidence? So, you know, you, you can also try to push on the requirement side. That's a very powerful side. idea. I, I was going to say, in all the teams I've been on, it's very hard. I think you kind of re get the requirements as received wisdom, and then the fun of it is really kind of going off and designing it. it I don't think it occurs to many of us in some cases to kind of push back. And, uh -huh. This is why I, I think you can establish a much richer dialogue uh, between people from, you know, what we used to call the, the problem domain side mm -hmm. and the solution uh, uh -huh. domain side by understanding that all three things are 
decisions in some way. I'm not calling them design, no, but they're okay. decisions. And they are of the same nature. They are decisions that has been made, that have been made at some point in time based on some beliefs or premises or, or facts or knowledge or mm -hmm. demands. And that we can challenge them at any way in the chain. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like there is just one boundary, uh, fixed boundary with very, very different processes on both yes. sides. The processes are relatively similar. We may use different jargon, we may use different way to express them, describe them, but it's from a cognitive perspective, it's the same kind of processes. So how much does, I think one of the, the ways of recognizing that we're falling prey to cognitive bias and trying to get over it is maybe to write down more of the rationales. Because once you have something written, I think you can go back and maybe revisit why yeah, came up with it. Yeah, um, that's, that's one thing. And, and, and we know that we cannot do that in a systematic fashion for mm -hmm. most systems because it's just too, too time consuming and people rapidly you know, give up. But at least for very important ones like choice of technology mm -hmm. or uh, major functionality or major non-functional attribute of a system, then for a few of them we should actually sit down and, and and explain what are the premises, what are the, the facts you know, that drive them, the constraints that drive them, mm -hmm. and um, you know, link them to, to the, the decision that we've made, whether it's a requirement decision or a design decision. Um, <coughs> maybe even looking at alternatives. Uh, that's something that we can do probably for a few design decisions systems like choice of technology. Right. So one of the other, kind of off on a little bit of a sideline, but one of the other things I was curious about was, you used the word rationality a lot. You kind of framed it as, sometimes we think we're making rational decisions, but it's these other things. It's political games or it's you know, kind of the fallacy that we have that are actually getting in the way and making that decision for us. But I felt like some of the examples you gave in the keynote were actually in a, in a way, they were examples of being too rational. Like uh, one of the, the examples you had was analysis paralysis, where I'm, I'm being rational and I'm trying to think through and gather data, but I just do it you know, to the nth degree. You know, far beyond yeah. where it was useful to me. Yeah, this, yeah, this is um, yeah, this is what's happening when people are afraid of making decisions. Uh -huh. um, so there's decision avoidance strategies. Mm -hmm. We push the decision onto somebody else. Or we sort of say, we don't have enough information to make a decision. Yes, but in many cases you don't have enough information to make a decision. But you need to make some progress. So you need to state some assumptions and then make a decision. And then revisit the assumptions uh, once in a while, especially if the assumptions prove to be not quite right and see which decisions are affected. Mm -hmm. um, so there's you know, little tactics that people have used to avoid making decisions or avoid taking responsibilities for the decision. So they push decisions onto other people. Uh -huh. So yeah, analysis paralysis is one example. Um, another one that they use is oh, it looks like you know we we um, tie we, we need to have a vote. That's uh -huh. another one that I don't like. You know, that means we haven't thought about it carefully enough. We haven't, you know, agreed on criterion, a criterion to decide, a criteria to decide, and so there's all kind of. Uh, you know, I see this game being played in the boundary system design uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. Oh, the requirement people didn't tell us about that. Oh, we're waiting for them. Please refine this. Please qualify that. Please yeah. give us some numbers. Uh -huh. You know. Uh, um, please prioritize the things. You know, that's a way to push back on uh, on the, the requirement side. Mm -hmm. I was almost wondering if you could phrase it in terms of trade-offs. I mean, rationality is, I think, important, but I think you have to trade off rationality with the, like you said, the need to actually make progress as yeah. well as you know, personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, there's that, a trade-off. This is why I had this slide about you know, as a software architect, I found that we cannot make perfect decisions. We cannot wait until we know everything about everything. We cannot go down every single uh -huh. design. So we have to make some decisions early. Know that they are tentative decisions. Know that there are some uncertainty. So 
associated with that and monitor those uncertainties because we're going to pile up more decisions depending on the early ones mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that at some point in time if we really hit some block mm -hmm. we can backtrack relatively rapidly and go down some other path so that's where some of the knack of the yeah. software designers or software architect uh, will, will show mm -hmm. knowing that yeah we'll have to make some progress we have to make some decisions whose decisions are based on relatively soft premises, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes just guts feeling, you know, uh, but uh, we have to identify those as such, as you know, decisions that are fragile. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and as we pile up more decisions on top of them, then they become relatively hard to, to change and remove. Uh -huh. But that's part of, you know, the, the being a good software architect is understanding in which sequence to make those design decisions. Mm -hmm. The naive one would sort of say, oh yeah, you know, this worked for us, so let's reproduce what, what we know. Or they would postpone, you know, I don't know enough, I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. or, and postponing doesn't help because you probably have all kinds of other people that want to start doing the development. You cannot, you know, wait for them three, six months until you know everything about everything to make the perfect set of uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the last question I was going to ask was, uh, well, I, you know, if I'm falling prey to these things, and one of the things you mentioned in the keynote is sometimes I'll use these, these strategies or these games consciously, other times it's unconsciously. And of course it's the unconscious part that I worry about, because how, you know, if I'm marching along and kind of doing, falling into these patterns and doing something that's really not getting us where we need to go, how do I how do I recognize it? I mean, one thing you mentioned was writing down some decisions, but if, but if I'm not getting to a decision, if I'm doing the analysis, that's where analysis. bring that's where bringing somebody in the team that uh, has another background than the rest of the team, somebody who thinks differently, somebody who's a, an extroverted uh, person in the middle of all these introverted persons uh -huh. helps. You know what I call the debunker, the contrarian. Mm -hmm. Somebody who will challenge things uh, a bit systematically, Th that has helped. Sometimes you don't have that inside the team, but uh, you bring some outsider. That's where, you know, I've played a role as a, as a, as a consultant in software architecture. There's a few companies that bring me regularly and they say, well, this is what we're thinking of doing, this is what, the, what we've, uh, the path on which we are. And, you know, based on what I've seen failing in other systems, I say, well, have you thought about this? Mm -hmm. What about that? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's another approach to that. Maybe you can reframe that. Maybe this part of the system and this part of the system, they're very similar. Maybe they should be implemented together. Mm -hmm. So bringing an outsider sometimes can help, you know, debunk some of the biases. Mm -hmm. Just having people aware of biases is already a good step. Mm -hmm. um, most people never heard of that I deal with have never heard of anchoring bias and confirmatory bias and representative net bias. Mm -hmm. Just being aware of them helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And then you know you can think about it not not necessarily in the midst of the action while you're working, but uh, you know, in your shower, uh, <laughs> driving to work, mm -hmm. uh, you can think, oh yeah, maybe here we've had a little bit of. Too much confirmatory bias mm -hmm. in our meeting yesterday. The, there's no magic recipe. I don't have a magic wand, <laughs> you know, the, the de bias uh, tool. <laughs> we'll get there someday, maybe. <laughs> Most of that is cabled in the bottom of our limbic system, yes. so there's not much we can do about it. <laughs> well, I we guess cannot, awareness is a good source. We cannot, you know, change the result of 50,000 years of evolution. Oh. <laughs> you know, the cavemen in ourselves are still there. You know, in some way. Unfortunately. <laughs> okay, well, good. Well, thank you, Philippe. This has yeah. really been a great discussion. Nice to speak Thanks. to you, Forrest. <laughs>